going to New York City with the family. So I saw one of your light curves in a nature paper. Well, it's oh, not yeah? a nature paper yet, but it's submitted. Yes, 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 yes. It's submitted on I see that two uh, days ago. Yes. It's celebrating to me the fourth. Let's see it. That's <laughs> what it is. May the fourth. I just have to help them. You just have to have a lightsaber right there. I thought it would be inappropriate that it's running your lane. You can't. Okay. Okay. So then, yeah. So. I am a thin layer of consciousness held together by a thick layer of belly. Don't look at me. I'm not involved. I'll just post the video. Yes, we are back. Yeah. But hopefully. Oh, yeah. I'm working on my slides. Presenting today, tomorrow. Yes. Yes. Um, gave Francesco a chance to no, we just no, share a little bit more about the Okay. Well, the real challenge is going to be how yeah. we do our like dream of what's this and get everybody to agree on what we submit. Um, you know, that's well, I guess that's true. That's to introduce uh, Mr. Christo Mint. Um, and um, Christo is originally from Estonia and then studied uh, physics and astronomy at Yale University, where he undertook a myriad of research projects, but worked with, in particular, Deborah Fisher, who many of you know is a very preeminent exoplaneteer. Um, and Deborah recommended him most highly, and so we were delighted that he chose to come to Harvard for his PhD. And then, Krista, when you arrived, I remember very well you saying, well, I'm taking a machine learning course at the CS department, and I'm really eager to apply machine learning to a large, messy data set. And I said, well, great, because I've got a big, messy data set. <laughs> and, um, and Christo pulled off a really amazing feat, which is that we've been operating the Merck survey in the, in the north and south for about 10 years. And uh, basically, we operate in a mode where there's uh, an overabundance of false alarms. Okay, so the false alarm rate is like 500 to 1, and that's just the way we have to run things. But you trained um, your code on the data to identify when the data was good and when the data was bad, and found a needle in a haystack, a planet that we had all missed, even though it had been in the data for several years. And lo and behold, it's already a target of uh, JWST. So it's a very, very important, one of the closest M dwarfs with a transit and rocky planet. Um, and so, um, uh, then Christo proceeded uh, to identify a number of rocky planets orbiting some of the very closest stars. And so I think really one of the very impressive products from your thesis, Christo, is, is really this is the list of rocky worlds transiting the closest stars, the smallest stars. These are the most accessible terrestrial planets for exoplanet uh, follow-up. Um, Full stop. There really are. There are not better, closer stars yet to be uh, studied. And um, 
And then in your final chapter, Christopher wrote four very nice papers in his thesis, and the final chapter um, is a discussion of the occurrence rate. And I, and I think it's fair to say that is the first meaningful statement about the occurrence rate of terrestrial planets orbiting the least massive but the most common stars in the galaxy. So kind of a profound uh, contribution. Uh, and it has been just an absolute delight to work with you, Christo. You have to understand from an advisor's perspective, um, you know, the day of your PhD defense, of course, is a great celebration, right? We're really eager to hear about everything you've been working on, and then we have the defense to follow. Um, but there's an element of sadness, right? Because you'll be, mm -hmm. you'll be moving away, and we won't get to see each other as much as, as, we, we, as we do, you know, for the past uh, five and a half years. Um, Christo, uh, in August, will be moving to Penn State uh, as a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Exoplanets and Habitable Worlds. Um, okay, Christo, so at this point, I invite you to tell us all about what you've been working on. Yeah, well, thank you for that very generous uh, introduction. And thank you all for being here at 9.45 a.m. in the morning. If you're anything like me, who's not a morning person at all, I completely understand the struggle. Um, so thank you, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, before I start with the presentation, um, I would like to thank members of my committee who have been advising me for the past six years and guiding my research, which has been a huge help, um, as well as Dave, my advisor, um, who's al always been here to answer my questions and help me in any way um, he can. So, um, okay, so let's get down to it. Um, so we are going to talk about terrestrial planets transiting nearby mid to late M dwarfs. And I would like to, you know, maybe start with sort of a broader science perspective and think about, you know, when people usually ask, when you're usually asked to think of a star, most people would think of the sun, right? Because th that's our star, right? it's the closest star to us. So why do we care about M dwarfs, which are tiny compared to, so this is actually a typical 0.2 um, stellar mass M dwarf. So it is tiny compared to the sun. Why do we care about these guys? And in particular, M dwarfs span a range of, well, the boundaries are a little fuzzy, they depend on metallicity, but from about 0.08 to 0.6 um, solar masses. So all of these have been, you know, even though there's almost a factor of 10 difference in terms of mass within this, which is something I'll get back to later. Um, this is, you know, all of these are, are called M dwarfs. And then all the more massive stars are your usual O, B, A, um, G, F, and K dwarfs, right? Um, so why do we care about M dwarfs? Well, um, Dave sort of gave away one of, the, uh, one of the interesting answers, which is actually M dwarfs make up about 75% of the stars in our neighborhood, and assumably about the same portion of stars in the galaxy. So even though most people think of the sun as a typical star, that is actually not the case at all, right? A typical star is an M dwarf. So I've been very excited to sort of um, study these guys because they're very, very abundant, and there's a lot of really cool science that we can do in terms of further characterizing planets um, around these types of stars. Um, so I have been mainly working uh, with the transit method, uh, which many of you might know is a method of detecting planets where you observe a star, and if a planet happens to pass in front of the star, um, it blocks off some of the star's light, and that sort of manifests itself as a dip in the light curve. Now this is obviously a, a very clean, perfect example where there's no background variation and you know, all the, you know, this is very simplified. Uh, but one of the key aspects about this is, as you can see over here, larger planets leave a uh, deeper uh, transit signal. So the depth of the transit signal, which directly impacts how well we're able to detect that planet, depends on the radius ratio or the ratio of the areas of the planet um, and the star. Um, so deeper, deeper planets or larger planets are easier to find. But you can also approach this from the, from the other side, which is to say, if it depends on the areas of those two, instead of making the planet bigger, you can make the star smaller and achieve the same effect. 
So over here, I've plotted the transit of an Earth. I mean, the size doesn't really matter because the y-axis is arbitrary. Uh, but essentially, I'm comparing typical transits for an Earth-sized planet around stars with different radii, right? So the black line is essentially Earth as an exoplanet, uh, you know, Earth transiting a solar radius star. Uh, then when you move to a, a 0.5 um, solar um, radii, which is an M dwarf, um, you get a much deeper signal, a factor of four in terms of the, uh, the, the depth is a factor of four higher. But then you can go even lower and you can go to 0.2 and suddenly you have a huge signal, right? Which is really what's you know, driven a lot of my research. The fact that these kinds of stars, planets around these kinds of stars are a lot easier to find. And we can, because of this, the, the ratio of the areas, we can look for much smaller planets compared to what we can see around sun-like stars. Um, there are other reasons why we're interested in M dwarfs. Um, as Dave briefly mentioned, um, M dwarfs are essentially the only type of star that we can, where we can place any meaningful constraints in terms of the planetary atmospheres in the near future, either with JWST or other instruments that are currently being built. And this is especially true for the lowest mass M dwarfs, because once again, this, does not, this factor does not only affect the transit depth, which is what you use to discover the planet, the spectroscopic features are also amplified by the same effect. So if you're doing a spectral analysis, you're doing, doing transit um, spectroscopy, um, you also get a much higher signal if you're looking at a, a very low mass um, red dwarf. Now, red dwarfs are in many ways different than the sun, other than the fact that they're a lot smaller. One of the main differences is the fact that they tend to be extremely active, right? Um, so about a third of M dwarfs within the solar neighborhood are still within um, their active XUV phase. Um, so they are, these stars are, uh, stay in this active phase a lot longer after they enter the main sequence compared to sun-like stars. And as a result, any planet that orbits an, uh, an M dwarf is going to be subjected over time to much higher amounts of um, XUV radiation, which can have profound consequences of the planet's atmosphere, for example. So that is one key difference that, you know, why I'm personally interested in comparing, you know, how the planet population around M dwarfs compares to the plant population around solar um, type stars. And that is one, one of the major differences. Uh, but there, there are also differences in planet formation. Um, specifically, well, planets form in protoplanetary disks. I've sort of chosen a, one of the, this is, yeah, this is just an illustration. Um, but um, the size and mass of that disk generally correlates with the, um, stellar mass. Um, so M dwarfs, because they're so much less massive, specifically the smallest M dwarfs, they tend to have smaller disks. So, and, and because planets form out of the material that's in the disk, that immediately you know, sets certain constraints on how many planets can, can form because you have a different amount of material to work with. Um, there's another important factor uh, for M dwarfs, which is the fact that um, unlike sun-like stars, um, M dwarfs don't tend to have um, very many cold gas giants, um, which if you, if you have a gas giant forming in a protoplanetary disk, it often, well, it can open up a gap in the disk, which essentially blocks both planetary migration, so migration of planets from beyond that um, distance into the inner system, as well as um, uh, the flow of pebbles, which, you know, one of the main sort of theories of planet formation is pebble accretion. And um, essentially having a gas giant in the outskirts of a planetary system when, when it's forming can effectively block off the flow of pebbles into the inner system, which can once again affect how many and what kind of planets form. And this is one of the sort of, one of the ways that people have tried to explain why 
the solar system doesn't have any super Earths. So the largest planet, the largest terrestrial planet in the solar system is Earth. And all of the, the other three are smaller. And when you look at exoplanetary systems, a lot of them tend to have um, larger terrestrial planets uh, with 1.1, you know, 1.2, 1.3 Earth radii. Um, so why don't we have those? And that, that could be one of the reasons, because we have Jupiter and Saturn that are capable of blocking the flow of material into the inner system while the planets are forming. Right? So at, at least that's one of, the, one of the theories that's been put forward to um, explain that. Um, so those are the ways in that, you know, these sort of illustrate how planet formation and evolution around m dwarfs can be uh, substantially different compared to that of uh, solar type stars. Um, now, before I get to my work, I would like to summarize what we know about planet demographics around low mass stars uh, from previous studies. So these results are mostly based on the Kepler mission, uh, which as many of you know, observed a large number of stars, but in a very small patch of the sky, right? So most of these stars are very far from, from the solar system. And because M dwarfs are a lot, they're a lot smaller, they're also a lot fainter. It is really difficult to find small planets around faint stars that are also very, very far away. So that immediately sort of sets limitations in terms of you know, what kind of constraints you can put on the planet population just from Kepler data. Uh, but there, you know, there were definitely some interesting results that came out of this. One of these is um, the uh, realization, and you know, this kind of you know, goes, it, this is in contrast to what I was saying earlier, which is you know, larger stars or more massive stars tend to have more massive disks. Therefore, you, could, you, you, know, you might expect that they're able to form more planets because they have more material available. This is actually not the true, not true. So based on the based on Kepler data, it has been shown that the um, occurrence rate of planets with certain sizes. So here they're specifically looking at planets from one to four Earth radii, actually goes up as you go down in stellar mass which is sort of the reverse of what you would expect, right? And that's where that Jupiter theory can, you know, explain a lot of things because, well, you know, maybe all of these more massive stars, they tend to, well, we know they're more likely to have Jupiters. That can block the flow of material into the inner system, which in turn can lead to fewer small planets. Um, but the key thing about this plot is, you know, people usually, you know, all of these studies, you know, they, they, they do include a category of M dwarfs. But um, as I said previously, M dwarfs span a wide range of masses, from roughly 0.08 to 0.6 solar masses. And essentially, all of the Kepler studies focused on the most massive M dwarfs because the least massive M dwarfs were just too faint and too far away that you couldn't detect small planets around them. Um, so here, M dwarfs really means. 0.5 solar mass stars, not 0.1 or 0.2 solar mass stars, which is once again a factor of five difference. And the other major um, sort of result from the Kepler mission is the realization that when you plot the planet population as a function of planet radius, um, it appears or it is bimodal, right? W which is interesting. So this, this was demonstrated for solar uh, type stars by Fulton et al. back in 2017. And then some of Ryan Cloutier's work specifically looked at heavier M dwarfs and found a similar bimodal distribution. Uh, but this is, you know, once again, the median stellar mass for this plot, for example, is a lot higher than, you know, the, the mass of the smallest M dwarfs, which haven't, haven't been studied as much. And a common interpretation of this uh, bimodal distribution is the fact that you know, this represents fundamentally two different types of planets, which is on the left side of this, of the so-called radius valley, you have planets that are um, predominantly rocky. So they're, um, when you measure their bulk densities, um, they're consistent with a purely rocky uh, composition and no sort of hydrogen-helium um, envelope. And then as soon as you add 
a little bit of hydrogen or a little bit of helium or a little bit of any kind of volatiles, that tends to sort of puff up the planet very quickly. And that's how you get this side, right? Which is essentially, I mean, there are some, there probably are some rocky planets in here as well, but all of the planets that are either enveloped terrestrials or water worlds or, you know, different types of planets which all have volatile envelopes, these are that second half of the population. And uh, because studies so far haven't really been able to go below one Earth mass in terms of sensitivity, this population is often referred to as super Earths because they are planets, the rocky planets that tend to be bigger than Earth, but they're consistent with being a pure rock, kind of like Earth. Um, and then everything over here is, is referred to as a sub Neptune because they're smaller than Neptune, but they're not purely rocky. Um, in terms of M dwarfs, there was a major study by Courtney Dressing and Dave Charbonneau back in 2015 that actually analyzed essentially the entire Kepler data set and all the M dwarfs um, that were available within that data set at the time to calculate a planet occurrence um, around these stars. And once again, these are early M dwarfs, so about 0.5 solar masses. So we're, we're not probing the, the lowest mass stars. Um, and um, the, when you plot it as a function of radius, the, you know, you, the sensitivity doesn't really allow you to see you know, whether the distribution is bimodal um, or not. Uh, but one of the main sort of outcomes of that research was the realization that, yes, indeed, M dwarfs tend to have many planets and more planets than um, more, other more massive stars. So they estimated that there are about 2.5 planets per M dwarf within a radius range of 1.4 our um, Earth and periods out to 200 days. Um, so, so based on that, we know that planets are very common around M dwarfs. So the key questions that have been driving my research over the uh, past six years have been extending this to the lowest mass M dwarfs, which haven't been previously studied, and because you know, several processes of planet formation and evolution do depend on the star and the stellar mass, um, I'm interested in investigating how that changes the planet population when you're looking at the, the lowest mass M dwarfs. So specifically, you know, here you have M dwarfs of roughly 0.5 solar masses, what happens if you push that lower, if you go down to 0.2? Because when you remember, when you go back to that transit signal, the difference was huge, right? Going from 0.1, 0 0.5 to uh, 0.2, uh, that's like a six to seven times deeper signal. So you can look for six to, well, um, if you divide the radii, you can look for more than half the size of the planet that you would be able to look at around um, a uh, 0.5 um, solar radius star. So does that increase continue over there? And it's not necessary, it, it's not obvious why it might continue, to be honest. Because the way, as I said, people explain why um, higher mass stars form fewer planets usually invokes the, pre the presence of Jupiter, which um, you know, blocks the inflow of material and therefore leads to fewer um, smaller planets um, in the interior. However, by the time you get to 0.5 solar masses, Jupiters are already quite rare. So when you move onward to even lower masses, it's not guaranteed that this sort of decrease in occurrence will continue. So that's one of the, and, and that's gonna be one of the punchlines at the end, which is, you know, does it continue or, 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 or is it fundamentally different? And then the other question is, what does the radius distribution look like for mid to late M dwarfs? And once again, um, M dwarfs, um, as I previously, <laughs> mentioned are many of them are active. They stay active for a much longer time than solar type stars. Um, and um, that can have an outsized effect on the planetary atmospheres because if you subject the planetary atmosphere to you know, billions of years of XUV radiation, um, photo evaporation, for example, can you know, strip away the atmospheres more easily. So are there as many planets with a substantial amount of hydrogen and helium, for example, around the lowest mass M dwarfs. And based on Kepler data, we couldn't really answer that question. 
below about 0.5 solar masses, which is really the highest mass M dwarfs. Um, so I have been working with a very nice uh, stellar sample that was put together by Chen Winters. Um, essentially, she compiled a sample of all nearby uh, mid to late M dwarfs um, within 15 parsecs of the sun. Actually, I'll, I'll put these up there. And by mid to late M dwarfs, these are all the M dwarfs with masses between 0.1 to 0.3 solar masses. And thanks to Gaia, we know the distances to the, these stars pretty accurately. So it's actually relatively easy to, you know, accurately construct this sample and make it volume complete, right? But essentially, these are all of the nearby, all of the low mass M dwarfs that are close enough that we could study them in, in detail. And there's a total of 512 stars um, in that sample. And many of them have uh, spectra, which Chen has gathered, uh, which you know, allows us to learn more interesting information about the star, um, as well as to figure out whether you know, which stars are binaries, because a lot of the M dwarfs are in binary systems. And if you don't account for that, that can bias your calculations a lot. Uh, so this has really been a great sample to work with because thanks to Jan, I essentially know which, star, you know which stars are binaries and which stars aren't. Whereas for Kepler data, you know, that used to be an issue where you know, you, you, it, it was more difficult to figure out whether you're looking at, a, you're looking at a, an eclipsing binary or a planetary transit, for example. Um, before I started my work, there were three known planets uh, within this data set, GJ1214b, uh, which um, was found back in 2009, I believe, uh, by Dave Charbonneau. And uh, so this is a planet um, orbiting a nearby M dwarf uh, with an orbital period of 1.6 days, and it is, lar it is quite a bit larger than Earth, so 2.7 um, Earth radii. And its density is lower than that what you would expect from a pure rock, which is roughly 4.7 4 to 5 grams per cubic centimeter. So in this case, there has to be something you know, in addition to the rock to explain the uh, bulk density of that planet. There's also LHS 40 b which is a temperate rocky planet around a, transiting a nearby M dwarf with an orbital period of 24.7 days. Now, how they found this, I'm still kind of in awe of this because f to find a, essentially, I mean, it's a super earth, but still close to an earth radius. To find this from, and this was found from, from the ground, by the way, using MIRTH photometry, right? A planet that transits once every 25 days. So you have to wait a long time to accumulate in transits. You know, the, the fact that they were able to find this, I, I, I think that is sort of an achievement in itself. Um, and then you have GJ1132b, which is a, another uh, super Earth that is consistent with a purely rocky composition. So, all, so these three planets were the only planets that were known within 15 parsecs of the Sun, orbiting stars with masses between 0.1 to 0.3 solar masses, uh, when I started my work back in 2017. And all of these were discovered by the MIRTH project. Um, so the first thing I did was I analyzed MIRTH data because, you know, why not? This data set had already produced three small planets and, you know, we had lots of follow-up observations of many of these stars. So I thought, why don't we conduct a planet search um, in that data set? And um, the MIRTH telescope array is actually, you know, interesting for various reasons, but one of its main functionalities, so you can see the telescope array in action over here, um, this is in Chile, so the Mirth South Telescope Array. Um, and as you can see from the top over there, um, the light curves are reduced in real time. And whenever a telescope detects that the uh, flux of a star drops, it switches to a high cadence follow-up mode automatically. So that allows you to survey a lot of stars on any given night. And, you know, stars that don't show variations, you can, you know, just get low cadence observations of these, but as soon as you de detect something that could be interesting, you can immediately follow that up, which is really crucial if you want to find small planets because 
you know, that low cadence data doesn't really, I, I mean, that, that won't show you a, 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 a convincing transit. Um, so that's something that, you know, we, we call mirth triggers. So whenever a star triggers the high cadence observing mode, and this is what a trigger might look like. So you see these lo low cadence observations and then suddenly the flux drops and the telescopes are, you know, they, they go like, you know, wow, something's going on, we, we better follow this up. And you focus all of your resources on this star as opposed to looking at other stars. Um, and then you get this nice signal. Now the problem is, because you're observing from the ground, there's a lot of other factors that can create signals, false signals that look like transits, right? There's variations in the atmosphere. Um, specifically for the smallest M dwarfs, uh, water vapor content in the atmosphere um, is very important to account for uh, because it affects M dwarfs differently than it does solar type and more massive stars, which are usually used to calibrate observations. So that immediately sort of gives you a challenge because you can't just use the normal, you know, bright stars to calibrate your observations because they are not affected by water vapor in the same way. And then there's also telescope systematics, you know, there, there's all kinds of other things that you always have to deal with. Um, so what I had, you know, so what I did is essentially, because we got, you know, several of these triggers every night, right? And most of these aren't planets, you know, otherwise we would be inundated with planet discoveries. Um, what I did was build a machine learning um, algorithm to figure out which of these signals are real. And um, I'll briefly go over that. Um, so I was taking a computer or a machine learning course at the time. And as they've said, you know, they were looking for, you know, they asked me to do a project looking at messy data and, you know, here it is, <laughs> right? Um, so essentially the way that, that you know, a, a simple neural network might work in that situation is the, you, you feed it some set of input parameters that can be related to whatever you think might be causing the signal. So the telescope pointing information, you know, sort of your, your sky background, um, as well as water vapor estimates, um, anything that can go into a, you know, changing the, um, the star's flux. And, and then some black box magic happens. <laughs> and I'm not gonna get into that too much because I feel like that could be a lecture in, in its own, right? But essentially, you know, you, you combine, the, the network tries to find combinations of these parameters that can explain the flux that you're actually seeing and, and that can reproduce the light curve. And in the end, you can actually uh, characterize the likelihood that the signal you're seeing is not caused by these factors. And because these are all factors that correspond to telescope systematics and atmospheric variations, if you can't explain the signal using these, then you might be dealing with a real planet. Um, and lo and behold, the same trigger that you just saw, actually, you know, this uh, was a trigger of LHS CLN40, which already had a known planet, that 25 day um, orbital period transiting uh, planet. Um, and uh, this signal came out as one of the lowest likelihood signals to be caused by systematics or atmospheric um, effects. So that immediately sort of caught my eye. Um, yeah. Um, and it could not be explained by, you know, because we know the orbital period, the transit times of the previous planet, it did not match that. So that was immediately obvious, you know, this is not another transit of planet B, because planet B isn't expected to transit any, anywhere around that time. Um, so I then went forward and conducted a massive sort of BLS search, which I do with most of the MIRTH data, well, most stars in the MIRTH data set, to figure out if there's an orbital period that matches this trigger. And there is one, actually, you can see. So this is a, the MIRTH light curve folded to an orbital period of 3.778 days. Um, and when you do that, you actually see a dip over here that matches the trigger, but it's not dominated by it. So there's actually a lot more data from other nights behind that. And on, on their own, that data was not sufficient to, the, you know, to trigger the um, high cadence mode on any other night, but combined, you can see the planetary transit. 
But essentially, I think what was really cool from this is the fact that, you know, this was done after we already, you know, I, I already suspected that this might be a planet. But essentially, you know, this is like finding an Earth-sized planet from a single transit in ground-based data, which I, I, you know, like this, I, I was really excited to work on this and I, I feel like this is one of the most exciting parts of the, the past six years, so. Um, we then managed to get Spitzer IRAC observations of, um, of the star and actually managed to capture, and this was purely by chance, we didn't like, this was not scheduled ahead of time. Actually, both transits, <laughs> right, one after another. And now you can really see like, yeah, this is really something, you know, this is, this is not like something you see from the, like water vapor variations from the ground. Um, and then we looked at HARP's radial velocities, which luckily there, there was a lot of because of the already known planet 1140b. And lo and behold, you can see the signal in RV data as well. So there are several different instruments that all confirm the existence of, of a second planet. Um, so in the end, LHS 1140c um, with orbital period of 3.8 days, so actually interior to the planet that was previously known, Slightly larger than Earth, so a super Earth, but once again, pretty much consistent with a purely um, rocky composition. Um, okay, so that was that project. And then shortly afterwards, you know, our, our lives changed forever. Well, no, actually that's not what I wanted to show. <laughs> this is what I wanted to show. <laughs> okay. Planet hunting spacecraft um, that will search for new April 2018, our solar system. right? Many of you remember, this is the launch of the Transiting SpaceX Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, which we'll sort of became the cornerstone the rocket. of the rest of my thesis because of all the amazing data that uh, started coming in uh, from TESS. Um, so yeah, that was back in 2018. And one of the main advantages of TESS, for me, who, you know, I knew that I, in order to constrain planet occurrence around the lowest mass stars, they have to be close. And Kepler data, you know, look mostly at far away stars. So TESS, TESS did not have that problem. Because even the prime mission, so years one and two, that was expected to cover more than three quarters of the entire sky. So a lot of these nearby M doors would fall within the um, TESS um, test viewing zone. Um, and since then, the test mission has been extended twice, and some areas have been reobserved, and the sky coverage has actually been extended as well. So, this is really you know, a, a great data set to work with. And it's a space based data, or it's a space instrument, so you don't have to worry about you know, the atmosphere or any of those things. Um, so, uh, one of the uh, first stars I worked on, and uh, one of the first stars where I analyzed test photometry was TOI 540. And here you see three um, sectors. So test data is divided into observation sectors. Three sectors of, of test data, right? And can, can you spot a transiting planet in here? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, if you haven't seen many of these, these kinds of light curves before, then you might think, like, yes, you know, there's a lots of these. You know, there's a drop here and a drop there and a drop there, you know, and, and look at all the planets that are in this data set. <laughs> no, actually, this is all stellar activity. <laughs> so TOI 540 is one of those still active M dwarfs where you have, you know, where it's extra hard to detect planets because you have so much variation from the star itself because it's uh, magnetically um, active. And it's not even, it's not necessarily the same every rotation cycle. So this is sort of modulated by the rotation period. You can see the pattern actually changes over time, which makes it even more complicated. Um, right, so it's a very active flaring star. Um, we actually managed to measure its X <laughs> XUV uh, flux completely by accident. We didn't plan to, apparently, this star was flaring so much that XMM Newton was in a slew mode and moved over the star and during that detected or measured the X-ray luminosity or the X-ray flux coming from the star. So they weren't even looking at it. It just, you know, blasted its radiation towards us. Um, 
So we found that, we estimated that about 0.3% of the entire bolometric luminosity of that star um, came from XUV, or comes from XUV, which is actually pretty much the highest sort of, there's an upper boundary to this because there's a saturation regime at some point, so you actually can't go much higher than this. So this is among, you know, the most active um, M dwarfs. Um, so I used a Gaussian process model to disentangle the signal. Um, so here you can see that nice stellar, uh, that variation that's modulated by the rotation period. And all of these, every single line represents a different rotation cycle. So you can see it does change over time. It's not a, a very um, thin line. Um, once you remove that signal, uh, you can actually see a planet with an orbital period of 1.24 days um, in there. Uh, we managed to follow it up with MIRTH, so we gathered nine follow-up transits. And so this is from the ground, and it required seven MIRTH telescopes looking at it at the same time. And you see there's lots of, you know, there's lots of baseline variation that you have to take into account. But essentially, you can see the transits, which is, which is really nice. And it's actually really consistent um, with the um, test data. Um, unfortunately, because it's so active, we couldn't constrain its mass because, you know, getting RVs for such an active star is very, very difficult. Um, but this is, this is one of the, essentially, one of the only, there's very few small planets that are known to orbit very active M dwarfs because of the intrinsically high variations. So this is essentially, and, and all M dwarfs go through that phase in, their, in the beginning of the revolution. So this is actually a, a good sort of, a good planet to study when you want to look at, you know, an, a planet around an M dwarf sort of in its earlier stages of the evolution versus most of the other planets we know of, which orbit M dwarfs that have already spun down. So this process is still ongoing um, around that star. Then the next star I worked on was LHS 475b, which was another planet uh, discovered by um, test data. and um, yeah, this was, I mean, this star was a lot easier to work with. The variation, the baseline variation is a lot smaller or lower, and that allowed us to really see a small planet with a radius of 0.96 Earth radii. So a planet smaller than Earth, very convincing transit. Um, we uh, followed this up with Mirth as well to confirm it. Now, some of you might think, well, you know, if, if you're getting light curves like this from TESS, why do you need that, right? Why do you need a, a you know, less sensitive version from Earth where you have to deal with all sorts of other things? The problem is that TESS has huge pixels. Um, I believe it's like 21 arc seconds by 21. Um, so, so these are huge and there's, a, there's lots of stars that fall within each pixel. So if, if you detect a light curve like that, you actually can't definitively say where it's coming from, which star is producing that. That's what, where um, Earth-based follow-up um, observations come in, because you can really, you know, which have much better angular resolution, so you can really sort of narrow down the source of the actual transit. And uh, yeah, once again, the Earth-based, the MIRTH data and the test data were uh, remarkably um, consistent. Um, unfortunately, no mass for that either, because it just doesn't have RV data at this point, but I'm hoping that people will do this in the near future. This is not a very active star. You know, go and get the mass. <laughs> that would be really, really great. Um, okay, so now we have six planets instead of the three we started out with um, in that data set. There were also three other planets um, that were discovered using test data while I was working on those three. One was the ultra-short period planet orbiting LHS 3844, which was the third planet ever discovered by TESS. So that was discovered very early in the TESS mission. And I analyzed the MIRTH data of it and once again confirmed, you know, the source of the transit and, you know, the, the data was very consistent. Um, yeah, and, and the orbital period is actually around 11 hours, so that's why it's an ultra-short period planet. And then there's this other exciting system, LTT 1445A, which um, Jen Winters worked on, um, that actually contains two planets. Both of these are super Earths, con consistent with a purely rocky composition. But what makes this system really interesting is essentially 
Um, I mean, if you're, I'm not a Star Wars fan, but I believe, what is it called, like Tatooine, or what, what the planet is? Are there any Star Wars Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah. I believe it, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, not my area of expertise. Um, but I believe it has three sons, right? Am I correct? Yeah. <laughs> well, this, this certainly has. So these planets are orbiting a star in a hierarchical three-star system. So literally, you would have three suns in the sky, which you know, is pretty cool to begin with. You know, so I'm, you know, great discovery. OK, so essentially, these, are, these nine planets are all of the planets that we know of that exist within that sample of low mass M dwarfs within 15 parsecs of the sun. So I thought, you know, but we have test data for most of these stars, apart from these red dots. We actually have, at the time, we had test data for 365 of these stars, and there's about 500 total. And we don't see a lot of planets, you know, we, we have nine, but a lot of these have light curves that don't show any evidence of a, of a planet. And we know we can find small planets, you know, the size of the Earth, because some of these discoveries were, you know, the size of the Earth. Um, so I wanted to go forward and measure, essentially constrain the occurrence rate based on not only the plants that we do see, but also the plants that we don't see. So what I did, and this was a, this, computationally, this was a nightmare. So I actually had to use the Harvard Canon supercomputer to do this. After optimizing my code several times, rewriting it in C++, doing everything I can to make it faster. It's just that essentially to estimate your detection sensitivity, you have to keep injecting thousands of planets into every single light curve and then running your planet detection algorithm to see if you recover it. And then you have to do it over and over and over for every single star, which is just a lot of computational uh, power. Uh, but essentially, I, uh, I created detection sensitivity maps for all of these 365 targets. And um, over here, what, what you can see is, you, this is just an example for one of these stars, right? The numbers represent what percentage of the, st of the planets with that particular radius and orbital period you would, recover, your, you would expect to recover. And something I would really like to point out, so here the x-axis is radius ratio, but this um, pentagon uh, over there represents an Earth radius. So around this star, you know, this is where Earth would be. And essentially, and the orbital period that it represents is a, is a planet that receives the same amount of total light from Earth. Because M dwarfs are a lot less uh, luminous, therefore you have to be a lot closer to the star to receive the same amount of light. Uh, so this was really exciting because it immediately told me, you know, wow, we could find Earth around that star with a 90% you know, consistency, which is really amazing. But not just that, there's a lot of parameter space to the left. You can go almost down to a Mars-sized planet for many of these stars. But none of these discoveries were Mars-sized. The, the smallest was 0.9 Earth radii. So where are those planets? I'll come back to that in a, <laughs> in a few minutes. Uh, but you can also combine all of the individual sensitivity maps to create a survey detection sensitivity. So this is essentially averaging over all of the stars in your sample. And here I'm plotting the seven known planets within that parameter space. And once again, you see there's, a, there's I mean, your sensitivity does drop if you go below an Earth, one Earth radius, but there's still a lot of space here where you have good partial sensitivity and no planet detections. Um, you can also do this for insulation because, you know, a, essentially if you have a planet with an orbital period of four days around a sun-like star, it's going to receive a lot more radiation compared to, you know, something orbiting a 0.2 solar mass star where the luminosity is, you know, a, a fraction of a percent compared to that of the sun. So maybe we shouldn't compare planets based on orbital period but based on the amount of ra radiation they receive. Because that's ultimately what's going to matter for a planetary atmosphere, for example. It's, it's going to be you know, how much total radiation you're getting, not what your orbital period is. Um, and when you do that, when you convert this to um, insulation, you, find a, you essentially get a similar picture where you're not really limited by your sensitivity. At least, you know, 
because if we were purely limited by sensitivity, you would expect to have a pileup of discoveries near you know, where your sensitivity drops off. And that doesn't really seem to be the case. Um, I'll also quickly mention, I cut this off at seven days because one, well, for computational cost is a major factor in this. The longer the orbital period is, the longer it takes to run the BLS and to detect the planet. But also because I, the sample size of 365 stars, um, when you get past an orbital period of seven days, the geometrical transit probability just becomes so low that even if you have a planet around every star, it's hard to say anything statistically significant from a sample of 365 stars. So it was scientifically motivated as well. And it corresponds roughly to an Earth, uh, four Earth insulations. For many of these stars, it went you know, even you know, down to one or 0.5, but for most of the sample, essentially, I could constrain the planet population uh, down to planets that receive four times the amount of radiation from their stars compared to Earth. Um, I then went on and modeled the underlying occurrence rate to find out how many planets, because this is, really, this is what we see, but there are several factors that play into this. Not just detection sensitivity, but also the trigonometric probability of a transit that you have to take into account. And when you have seven data points, you have to make some assumptions in terms of what the underlying population um, looks like. And I tested different models, but I actually found that a pretty simple model worked relatively well um, to you know, model the underlying planet distribution. Um, it's a power law as a function of orbital period where the power is actually close to actually pretty much close to one, which is consistent with previous studies who have tried to do this as well. And then the um, radius distribution can actually be modeled quite well by a Gaussian distribution centered around 1.1 um, Earth uh, radii, uh, which sort of encapsulates all of, all of these planets and, and drops off both to, towards smaller sizes as, as well as larger sizes. So this, is immediately, this immediately looks very different from the bimodal distribution that um, I showed before for uh, sun-like stars, where you have two distinct peaks. Here you can model this with a single peak, and then over here, where you're supposed to have sub-Neptunes, you don't have anything, right? So what's going on? Um, I should also say that you can, you know, based on that model, you can actually evaluate the numerical occurrence rate. Uh, so for planets, smaller than 1.5 Earth radii, I got 0.61 planets per star when you take into account the geometrical transit probability as well. Whereas for sub-Neptunes, you can place a higher limit of 7.2%, which is a lot, a lot lower than this. Um, yeah, so that was a major question. Where, where are the sub-Neptunes? We're, we're, we're seeing this peak, which matches with what you would expect the terrestrial planets to be like in terms of radius but we don't see uh, the sub-Neptunes. Um, now the caveat is we do know sub-Neptunes actually exist around these stars. GJ1214b, which I previously mentioned, is a sub-Neptune with a radius of 2.7. The problem is this star was not observed by TESS or has not been observed by TESS um, as far as I know, so I couldn't use it in my analysis. But even if you assume, even if you add in that planet to, to the data set, having one planet in this spin would still be consistent with this upper limit. It would, it would yield about a point, 0.05 planets per star, this, this one planet, because detection sensitivity is essentially 100% around here. Um, okay, um, so, um, and the, the last thing I would like to show is, I essentially went and compared the occurrence rates of my work, which, once again, the median mass of the stars in my sample is 0.17, which is three times lower than the previous sort of most comprehensive Kepler study, where you know they also looked at M dwarfs, but the median the median mass was 0.5. So we have a factor of three difference, and you know so so I essentially wanted to compare the occurrence rates and see you know what might be different based on you know the uh, based on stellar mass. So when you look at period space, um, so I've written 0.5 to 1.5. This is really the rocky terrestrial population. So this roughly corresponds to that. You find that for periods below seven days, 
smaller stars do tend to have more planets. But a part of that effect is because systems are more compact around, uh, around these stars, right? Because the, once again, a star with the same orbital period receives a lot more light around that star than um, that one. However, the sub-Neptunes are essentially missing, whereas they do exist for the, um, for the more massive M dwarfs. Um, so now you can convert that to insulation. So you, you, you essentially remove the effect of the orbital period because the radiation environment is so different for the same orbital period um, based, on, um, your, based on the stellar mass. And you actually find a similar pattern. So um, there are essentially the same amount of terrestrial planets around um, small M dwarfs, so 0.2 solar masses, than there are around large M dwarfs. This is pretty much exactly the same, which, by the way, immediately answers that question of do we expect the increase in occurrence rate to continue? This suggests it doesn't, because you know, we're, now we're going a factor of three lower in stellar mass and you still have a consistent occurrence rate that, that doesn't, you know, hasn't gotten higher. Whereas if you compare sun-like stars to 0.5 solar mass stars where you do see an increase, that's only a factor of two difference. And for sub-Neptunes, you, you find a similar picture. Essentially, for planets hotter than four Earths, um, around a 0.5 solar mass star, they are roughly equinumerous. Over here, you essentially have, you have very few sub-Neptunes and the planet population is almost entirely terrestrial. So the, this ratio is actually roughly 14 to one if you, uh, whereas you know, this is one to one. And this, I mean, one of the main takeaways from this is, you know, this could be the result of the fact that the lower mass stars or lower mass semidors stay ex-UV active for much longer than you know, even 0.5 um, solar mass stars. And therefore, it is, it is plausible that essentially sub-Neptunes, at least close to their host stars, get stripped of their atmospheres. Whereas around 0.5 solar mass stars, even though they receive the same amount of total radiation, because it's not as, you know, because less of it is in XUV, they could be better at retaining their um, envelopes or, or atmospheres. And finally, um, I would like to end by commenting on this, you know, because I, I sort of hinted at the fact that you have some sensitivity for planets smaller than 0.9 Earth radii. So what can we say about that? Because this distribution is really peaked at 1.1, but it drops off to both sides. Um, so I calculated an upper limit of 21, so 0.21 planets per star with radii between 0.5 and 0.9. And once again, this assumes a constant occurrence rate with uh, radius within the spin. And you have to make an assumption because there are no discoveries here. So I just took the simplest one. But if you do that, you actually find that um, essentially sub-Earth-sized planets are less common than um, larger planets, which could also mean you know, that this is another way that the planet population around the least massive M dwarfs is different. Um, because you don't have gas giants, you have more inflowing material, right? More migrating super Earths as well as in inflowing pebbles um, that can form larger planets in the interiors. Whereas, you know, for the solar system, Jupiter cuts off that flow, and therefore any planets that are in the inner um, solar system are smaller. They are they're all smaller than Earth. So that is sort of one way to explain this, why, you know, this discrepancy exists between um, low mass stars and sun-like stars. Um, okay, um, I'm running out of time, so I'll quickly go over the conclusion. So we are still finding planets around the nearest mid to late M dwarfs, which is exciting. So I presented three of these, 1140C, 540B, 475B. They're all small planets around um, nearby M dwarfs. These are the kind of star planets that we can where we can actually meaningfully measure or put any constraints on the presence of an atmosphere in the near future. You, you really can't do that with sun-like stars yet. Um, on average, uh, these stars have 0.6 planets per star with orbital periods below seven days. This is consistent with um, more massive M dwarfs. 
But because more mass less massive M dwarfs tend to have more compact systems, so um, the, a planet receiving the same amount of radiation has a lower orbital period, when you compare planets of equal stellar insulation, the total occurrence rate in mid to late M dwarfs is actually half compared to more massive M dwarfs due to the low abundance of sub-Neptunes. The terrestrial planets are just as common. Sub-Neptunes are heavily suppressed, which is not what you would expect, you know, if that trend continued of, you know, like planet occurrence going up with decreasing mass. And the hot planet population in the smallest M dwarfs is almost exclusively terrestrial. And uh, I found that the terrestrial planets, terrestrial planets outnumber water worlds and the developed planets, which is, you know, combines to make sub-Neptunes at a ratio of about 14 to 1. Just once again, around sun-like stars, they're roughly equinumerous. And finally, Earth-sized planets appear more common than planets below 0.9 R Earth. But, um, you know, the sensitivity does drop off once you get to these radii. So this is, you know, this is statistically not as strong of a statement than, you know, the rest of these. So I'm, I'm actually really interested in, in looking into this further in the future to see if, if there really is a difference. If, if planets that form around low mass stars are preferentially Earth sized and, or slightly larger as opposed to smaller than Earth. And if you want more information, then all of these, um, all of that can be found. There's four publications. I have three of them. Two of them are out. <laughs> one was just accepted for publication, and another one is currently under review. But they're all up on archive as well. Um, so if you want more information, you're, feel free to contact me or just look them up. Um, and um, yeah, do we have time for questions? We certainly do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Christo. Okay. Who would like to ask a question? All right, Matt. So, I mean, it's, 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 this is really impressive stuff. I really enjoyed your talk. Oh, thank um, you. This question about um, this really interesting division between the you know, abundance of, of sub-Neptunes. And if, if you, could you make a prediction, or are you willing to make a prediction, about where that transition actually happens? I mean, if you've got two bins, can you be more precise? In, do you mean in terms of radius? Yeah, I mean, yeah in terms of, or, or in terms of the, the mass of the end dwarf. You know, where, oh. Where do you think that would happen? Mm. That, I get, yeah. That's a great question. Um, I think it's, to a certain extent, I don't expect there to be a, a sharp cutoff because, you know, I, I expect as you go to lower and lower masses, you just might have fewer and fewer sub-Neptunes. And some of Ryan Cloutier's previous work which went down to you know, these 0.5 mass M doors, that sort of showed that. So he actually um, calculated the sort of the ratio of terrestrial planets or super Earths to sub-Neptunes. And he showed that there was a trend that sort of gradually um, goes down. Uh, but then there's also the question of, you know, if the distribution is really bimodal and the other peak is just really small, I mean, it would be interesting to see where that, um, where that division is in radius space. Because so far, you know, we only have this one planet, you know, in the sub-Neptune population that's two, two, at 2.7, and then all the terrestrials are between 0.9 and 1.3. So it's really hard to say where the transition is. We would need more data for that. Um, so, so the hypothesis is about stellar activity that's stripping the yes. sub-Neptune. So then... I think that's one of the most compelling explanations that I've heard, because it, it sort of readily explains why you know, because these are also all relatively hot planets, so four times, you know, the radiation that Earth gets, so not in the habitable zone. So they're getting a lot of radiation anyway. If a lot of it comes in XUV, it, it is very probable that it just strips all of these planets of their atmospheres. And there actually have been studies of some of these planets that I mentioned by Laura Kreitberg and Hannah Diamond Lowe. So 3844b, for example, um, is essentially um, so Laura Kreitberg looked at the phase curve um, of, um, um, of the planet and found that it's essentially consistent with a completely bare rock with you know, no kind of atmosphere. And Hannah Diamond Lowe's work has found essentially the same conclusion for many of the um, other terrestrial planets. So they all appear to be just, you know, 
they don't seem to have very thick or puffy atmospheres. We can sort of already say that for sure. Emily. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's very hard to say based on the small sample size of planets. Um, I, I do think you're, you're absolutely right. So there's this recent debate about, you know, are sub-Neptunes really mostly enveloped terrestrials or are they water worlds, which haven't formed in situ, but they can form outside the snow line and then migrate inwards. And having a gas giant would obviously cut off or limit that migration as well. Um, but I did not detect a, a, a uh, population of water worlds. They might emerge at longer orbital periods, that is possible, um, or you know, near the habitable zone, so that is definitely possible. Um, but I also think you know, some, of the, some of the work that has sort of tried to constrain the um, abundance of water worlds has still focused on more massive M dwarfs. Um, so there, there might still be a, a strong correlation with stellar mass and these guys might, I mean, which is bad news for, for example, TRAPPIST-1 is the planet that, or this planetary system that most people are very excited about. The only reason it's not in my sample is because it has a mass of about 0.08 or 0.09, which is right below the 0.1 cutoff that I have. Otherwise, I would have ha that in there. And it has seven planets, and they're all on the left side. None of them are sub-Neptunes. You know, so this ratio becomes even stronger if you put TRAPPIST-1 in there, because all seven, you have seven and zero, right? So I do feel like there, it just might, this population of planets might just be very different from what we expect from heavier M doors, as well as sun-like stars. And because these are the types of planets that we will study in more detail in the near future, especially with JWST and other instruments, I think it's very important to, and to kind of recognize what these, you know, what kind of differences there are, so that we don't kind of generalize from, you know, um, observations of 0.2 solar mass stars, and you know, use that as a basis for, you know, kind of predicting how many you know, Earth's, or how many habitable planets might be around sun-like stars, because the populations can be very different. I, I think that's the main sort of takeaway or concern that I have, is that if, if, you, if you assume that M dwarfs behave like, you know, the Dressing and Charbonneau 2015 M dwarfs with a median mass of 0.5, then you might, you know, completely, you know, your estimate for, you know, what kind of planets are out there around these types of stars will be very, very different. Okay. So this result of the lowest mass indoors at like six planets per star in these short orbital periods, it seems that the far red and infrared RV surface that recently started up should be finding tons of these exactly where they're sensitive, right? And so how do your results match up with what's coming out from the early results in the RV surface? Um, I think actually, so I compared these results. So in the paper, um, I compared these to recent RV studies, um, spe specifically there's one by Sabata et al. from 2022, and it actually, it was consistent. Um, I think the problem is that the transit probability for any given star is just very low. So you can have a lot of, I, I think the point, the point 0.6 seems to be consistent. I, I, I don't think there's a, a tension with um, RV studies there. And once again, this is, an orbital period, you know, below seven days. So if you go further out from that, um, it, this is going to increase as well. Um, so in Dressing and Charbonneau, they found, you know, roughly, I believe it was almost one planet per star with that orbital period range. But 
their entire prediction was 2.5 planets per star. So when you go to longer orbital periods, you know, this is going to go up by, might go up by a factor of two or three as well. Yeah. Charles, so this might be a different question, but how do you know the masses of all of these animals? Uh, oh, <laughs> that is a great question. So, um, we don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we, we, have, we have a psychic who tells us what the masses are. Um, yeah, no, um, I think Chen Winters has really done a phenomenal job uh, by essentially really characterizing all of these stars. Um, I have recalculated some of these masses. So essentially, you know the parallax from Gaia, so you know exactly what the distance is. You know that very well. Um, and then you can use the, uh, you can use the luminosity to get the radius. And then you can use a mass radius relation, for example, to estimate the mass. And there are certain errors associated with that as well. But typically, they're in the order of about 0 0.01, 0 0.02 solar masses. So we're pretty confident that you know, we, we have most of the stars that we should have within that sample. Um, but yeah, it's essentially empirical studies you know, that have been made. Um, and you know trends that have been derived from those to convert between luminosity, radius, mass, and so forth. Follow up or a different question? This is a different question. So if I heard you correctly, it was an accidental detection of XUV from an slowing motion model. Of, um, yeah, XMM Newton. Yeah. So is anybody doing a systematic search with XMM Newton for XUV radiation from these stars? It might not take a lot of time. That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure how common that is. I, I just, you know, it, it just seems to be relatively uncommon that, you know, you, you just, you're slewing your telescope and then you accidentally detect and, you know, you make an XUV detection. Um, I, I'm actually not sure. Um, I know, I think Alison Youngblood is definitely, some of her research is looking into the, or sort of characterizing the XUV brightness or XUV fluxes of nearby, um, nearby stars, including M dwarfs. Um, but yeah, I, I actually, I, I don't have a very good answer for that, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so I do want to first also thank the committee. Uh, so the committee chair is Karen Oberg, and then we have Mercedes Lopez Morales, Dave Latham, and our external examiner, uh, <laughs> Professor Phil Muirhead, who's joining us from Boston University. Uh, so the committee is going to um, meet with you, and uh, we'll see how things go, Christo. Uh, and then uh, uh, we'll report back with an email, maybe in a couple hours. So. Okay. Yeah, I don't know.